everybody and welcome. This is Audrey Mack with Gotel Ministries. I want to remind you to subscribe and put on um, the little bell there and go on our social media. We've got all kind of goodies and good stuff to feed your spirit. Today I'm going to continue this message I started on the trap of offense, which is the number one tool of Satan in the last days to stop the revival, the awakening in the church and in your own life. We saw in the last episode that, you know, when um, we allow offense is the way that the devil can get an entrance into our life to destroy our witness, to steal our peace and our joy, to, uh, to cause our heart to not be able to receive the blessings of God because when you are in offense, your faith will not work. Why? Because when you are offended and stay offended, you are not walking in love. And faith works by love. Amen. And so we saw the importance to recognize, not to be deceived, like Jesus says, but to realize that an offense is not just a coincidence, You know, it is a tool, it is a strategy of Satan to destroy you, to destroy your witness, and to, you know, destroy your life. Amen. If, for example, I talked about that in the last episode, uh, you know, this precious woman in Colombia, she started to suffer from arthritis, and and she was in pain for years and years, and that offense in her heart was working like poison killing her from the inside out. And the moment she chose to forgive, the anointing just poured over her and she was, she was instantly healed. And I cannot tell you the number of times I have seen that happen. You know, I love that in the Bible, you know, there is a man in Second King chapter 5, there was a, a powerful man, Naaman, you know, um, he, he was not a Jew, but he had a little servant who was a Jewish girl, and that guy had leprosy. And, and she told him, why don't you go and see the prophet? You know, why don't you go and see the prophet, and he'll pray for you, and you'll be healed. So he went and got, you know, letters of recommendation from the king, and he went with the whole of his entourage, and they went to see the, king, the, the prophet, you know, Elijah, and, and here they go in grand, in grand pomp, you know, and... and, and and they went and, and somebody, the, a, a servant, knocked at the door of the prophet and said, my master came from afar and he came because he needs healing. He's a leper and we were told, oh, men of God, that you could heal him. And the prophet, you know what he said? He said, go and tell your master to go and dip in the river seven times. Here it is. He didn't even come out. He didn't even meet the, the, the guy even though he was a big dude, you know what I mean? He didn't take the time to even meet him, say hello, lay hands on him, and Naaman, that's what he had expectation. Because he was a man, a man of importance, a man of status, a man of riches, and so he expected. He think he, surely the man of God is going to come and wave his hand and, you know, lay hands, you know, speak grand things or whatever, but the prophet didn't do. What he did, he was asking that man to simply walk in humility and obey and go in the river. Oh, and and Naaman didn't like that. He got all huffed up and puffed up and, I'm leaving, I'm going, what is that man of God? I should have stayed. Don't we have rivers over there? I mean, he went on and and thank God for her little uh, 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 servant or something. He said, hey, If he had asked you to do something difficult, would you have, you know, done it? Well, now he asked you to do something so simple. Why don't you do it? And finally, Naaman chose to humble himself and simply obey. Now, why was he offended? He was offended because he was putting great expectation on the prophet Elijah. And my friend, that's offense in one sense is because the big you has been, you know, walked upon or, or your expectations were not met. 
My friend, you need to be, we need to be careful to put expectations on people. Because if we put expectations on people, we are opening the door to get disappointed and offended. So you see, thank God Naaman chose to humble himself and, and, and lowered the expectation, obeyed, and he was completely healed. Amen. So that was just a little word of warning and caution because you remember Jesus says, take heed that no one deceives you. You see, when, when, when offense is a deception of the devil, like we said, to, to destroy you. Amen. And not only can it destroy your witness, not only can it steal you of your peace and your joy, amen, and your well-being, but it, it, it will steal and rob you of all the blessings of God. But it will, if you allow me to say it, it will affect the people around you. You know, in, we read, and I will repeat that verse in Hebrew chapter 12, in the verse 14, it says, looking carefully, or paying attention carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And the next verse says, and by this, many become defiled. You see, if you don't deal with that offense, it's going to become like we see a root of bitterness and out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Have you ever met somebody, I mean, in the church, they get offended and all of a sudden, you know, we, we have a saying, flocks of the same feathers, you know, birds of the same feathers flock together. When somebody gets offended, all of a sudden, they gather a little entourage. Did you know what he did to me? Did you know what he said to me? And all of a sudden, yeah, I know. And they, all of a sudden, a whole group in the church is being affected. Because out of, if there is a root of bitterness in your heart, offense, hurt, strife in your heart, sooner or later, it's going to come out of your mouth, and soon or later, it's going to affect the people around you. And that, my friend, will affect the unity of the church. And that, my friend, can hinder and stop the move of God, the anointing in the church and in your life. I know you want God to move through you. I know you want to see signs and wonders and the anointing flow through you. I know you do. So beware, take heed, let you be not deceived. And beware that offense can be that trap that can put, hinder the anointing in your life and hinder the move of God in your church. Amen. But did you know, I, I found that something quite amazing. You know what I discovered in the Bible? How do false prophets, you know, you, people are not born false prophets. You're not born in your mother's womb with a call, hear ye, hear ye, uh, my call is to be a false prophet. No, no, no. How does it start? You have a call of God in your life. Uh, 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 you, you are called to preach, to teach, to spread the good news, right? But a preacher that gets offended, it's a preacher all of a sudden that had the potential to let offense grow roots of bitterness in the heart. And out of the, the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Listen to this. It is amazing. In Matthew 24... Verse 10 and 11, Jesus is making that connection. You know, the scriptures are not written by coincidence. A verse is not placed after another verse just by happenstance. It's very strategic. And here in the verse 10, he says, many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another, and then... Many false prophets will rise and deceive many. Do you know what Jesus is telling us? That there will be preachers. Now we're not talking simply about believers. 
you know, uh, uh, John and, and Jane and, and Peter. We're talking about preachers called into the fivefold ministry that all the call that are called to preach and they preach, but then they get offended and they allow that offense to row roots of bitterness in their heart and out of the abundance of their heart, they start preaching from a wounded heart. They start prophesying, ministering, and preaching from an offended heart. And that, my friend, will make them a false prophet. Because in the Bible, you know the word prophets? It is not just predicting the future. The word prophets is the word prophes prophesuo, which means declaring divine utterances. You know, when you preach under the anointing, you are declaring divine utterances by the Spirit of God. Amen. But if you preach and you teach and you prophesy with an offended heart, chances are you'll become a false prophet. And I want to send a warning right there. If you are in the ministry and you are called to preach, to teach, make things right. Do not allow that offense to stay and remain in your heart because you are going to feed your people a bitter, sweet water. You're going to feed something that will be tinted by offense. No matter what you preach will be tinted with what is in your heart. You know, Jesus said in James, he said, you know, you have a, 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 a source, a, a spring of water. He said, you don't have salt water and pure water coming out of the same spring. It's either one or the other. The moment your heart is offended, out of your heart you will prophesy, teach, and preach tinted, unpure water. I know, Selah means silence. Think and meditate on this. How important it is in these last days. We do not want to allow offense to remain in our heart even one second. I don't care what somebody did. I don't care what they say. I don't care what it looks like. Remember, make peace with all men and holiness without which no one can see or hear the Lord properly. It is so important. I know it might shock some of you, but you know, if you are humble enough to hear it and receive it, it can turn your whole life and your whole ministry. Amen? Hallelujah. And so, here is the good news. Are you ready for a little bit of good news? You can change that offense into promotion. We have so many examples in the Bible. You remember Joseph? I mean, look at Joseph, the poor guy. He had a call of God from the time he was a child. The favor of the father was upon him. He had a coat of special color. And of course, he didn't use a lot of wisdom. He went out telling his brothers, oh, I'm this, I'm that, I have that call, you're going to bow down to me, uh, and I'm, you know, all of the stuff. That was not very smart. You know, sometimes your vision or your call sometime, you've got to keep it to yourself. You know what I mean? But so here is Joseph, and you know what happened to him. He got sold into slavery. Then he got put. I mean, the guy just did his best. He, rised, he rose up to the surface, but then, bam, put down under the water. He got thrown into jail. Then, I mean, he kept a good heart. He was helping the baker and the, uh, and the, the, the cup bearer, you know. But then they forgot about him. Do you think he would have had an opportunity to get offended again and again and again? But he kept a pure heart. He chose not to get offended. And you and I know what happened to him. Because he chose no matter what curveball was thrown to him, no matter how many you know, scandalon, how many offenses were put on his path. He chose to keep a noble heart, a pure heart. He chose to forgive again and again and again. And even at the end, you remember when he had his brothers, his father Jacob had died, and here were his fathers, and man, his fathers, his brothers were like, oh, now he's going to put us in prison. Now he's going to take revenge. You know, they were looking at, Joseph, according to their own heart. You know, sometimes we, we can do that. 
We judge somebody's intention according to our own heart. And, and but Joseph said, uh-uh, no. Why would I try to get revenge? And then he says something so powerful. I believe it's in Genesis 50, verse 20. He says, what the enemy meant for evil, God has turned it around for good and for the salvation of many people. And you know what happened to Joseph. I mean, no matter how many times the devil tried to put him under the water, how many times the devil tried to destroy him, how many times he tried to stop the call of God on his life, man, he was like a ball under the water. Bam! He kept on going back to the surface. And you know what happened? He got promoted. The right hand of the Pharaoh, the highest guy in the land. And truly, he was able to be such a, 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 um, a source of blessing to the whole world. You see, because he chose to forgive again and again and again, God pro was able to promote him. Don't let offense put your life on hold. Don't give the devil a stick to beat you up. Choose to forgive. And if you do that, God himself will revenge you in his own way, in his own time. But more importantly, God will raise you up and honor you before men. And, and, and men honor you before the very people that did you wrong. That's the best revenge you can ever have. Don't you think? Oh, glory to God. Oh, we see King David. I mean, here is a guy had a call. He knew he was anointed. And because Saul got jealous, he allows jealousy and bitterness and strife to get into his heart. I mean, and here again and again and again, he tried to kill David. And you know, it was tempted. It was tempting for David because twice, I mean, think of it, twice it looked like God handed him over to him for him to kill him. You know, he was in the cave of Abdullam. And, and, you know, he went, and here Saul went to relieve himself, went to the bathroom, I think. And it says that David went and cut the border of his, of his robe. And then when Saul had, was at a big distance, David went and said, Hey, king, oh king, you know, why are you trying to kill me? I could have killed you right there, but I, I didn't. And you know, it's interesting. He cut the, 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 a little piece of his, of his um, robe. And even then David felt bad. Even then David was like, oh, he repented. I heard something that I thought was interesting. Now I have not, don't quote me, but because I have not really researched it, but I heard it. And I'm going to take a risk. I heard that in the Jewish culture, if somebody was dead, they would, you know, cut a, 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 a piece of the, of, of the robe of the person as a sign of mourning, the, the rendering of the garment, you know. And so when Dave, David cut, a, cut a, a piece of the garment, Saul's garment, in another word, it was an expression that says, hey, you are as, you know, you are as dead as that, you know. You, uh, and, and, and it was like a, almost like a saying, yeah, I could have killed you, but I didn't, but next time I might get you kind of, you know what I mean? And there he repented, his heart convicted him, and he repented to even have thought that, or spoken that with a little piece of garment, amen? And so we find that, that because David, time and time and time again, refused to get offended, even at the end, when King Saul was killed in the battle, and somebody ran to him with a, yeah, I guess, thinking he was going to be the bearer of good news, your enemy is dead, da da da, -da you know, and David, when that man came pretty much, you know, being boastful and, and bragging about Saul being dead, David was so bothered in his heart. His heart was so humble. He was so free of bitterness and offense that he had the guy that bragged about killing Saul. He had him put to death. You see how much, how free he was from offense. And we know that the unknown, because he knew that offense would stop the anointing on his life. 
He knew that offense would stop him from being entering and fulfilling his call as a king, as a priest. So you see how important, how important it is to be free, to, to, be, to take heed, to perceive, to recognize the strategy of Satan and to be completely free from it and not fall into the trap. Amen. And of course, we know David was the greatest king that ever lived. He was the one that brought forth the Messiah. You know, that's why everywhere, you know, they would call Jesus the son of David. You see how promotion came, how David was so promoted. He was called the man after God's own heart because he had a heart after God that refused to hold offense, a heart that chose to love God and love people more than love himself. My friend, you know, if I could add this, when we are offended and stay offended, you know why? Because our ego is on the way. Our ego is getting in the way. It's all about me. Can you believe what they said about me, what they did to me? We, let's be honest. You are thinking about you, me, I more than you're thinking about the kingdom of God about your witness to be able to love and, and, and show the, 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 the reality of God to others. It is so important. Amen? And so um, we've got to understand. We have to be like Joseph, like King David. You know, we can turn that offense into a promotion. It can be like a stepping stone to take you higher, to you know, to take you in a greater anointing. And you know, I've noticed something, and I like to add that. As a woman in the ministry, I noticed that every time there are those kind of offense, those things, those betrayals, those things that hurt, now I've come to the place where I stop, and I'm like, ooh, I must be getting close to promotion. I must be getting to a place where God is wanting to take me higher, go to the higher level. So that's why the devil is throwing a curveball, he's throwing, here it is, with an offense. And you know what I've, I've recognized? Is that the devil will use, most of the time, the people the closest to you. You know, like the devil used Joseph's brothers and own family to do that to him. Amen. David, you know, he used the king to do that to him. Amen. And so the devil will use the people, not the person you cross once in a while or you, you just happen to meet or, you know, he's not going to use those people really. But the people that have the greater potential to offend you are the people that are the closest to you. You know, um, I'm going to make myself vulnerable and I'm going to tell you, you know, when I first got married, I remember I had that, here again, I had that expectation. You see? Because when I left France and I left my, you know, native country, God gave me a promise. He says, if you leave your land, your family, your brothers, your sister, your mother and father, and all of that for my sake, you know, you will inherit a hundredfold in return, family, friends, brothers, sisters, you know, with persecution, you know. So I had that expect. All these years I was a single woman, traveling by myself, having to fend for myself, having, you know, always to, to take care of myself. And so I had that expectation that when I would get married, I would have a new family, a new church. They will love me. What is not to love, right? They, I will have a mother. I will have brothers and sisters and nephews and uncle and maybe grandmothers. And, you know, I had so much expectation. And then I got married to my husband, you know. And then even on the wedding day, I spoke what Ruth spoke. Your brother, your mothers will be my mothers. Your brothers will be my brothers. Your land will be my land. You know, wherever you go, I'll go, you know. My heart was all in it with that expectation that I'm finally going to get a mother, you know, a mother in love. I will have brothers. I will have nephews and nieces, and it's going to be all wonderful. It didn't work that way. 
My mother-in-law did not want me. You know, for a reason that is too long to explain, she completely rejected me. She could not stand the fact that here I was getting remarried to her son, you know, after he had lost his wife to cancer, you know, a year or, uh, a year or so before. You know, I think it was like 13 months. And she could not, you know, accept that. Therefore, she took it upon herself, number one, to make me, to let me know, but just to really, she had such an influence in the family that she had such an impact upon the family that all of a sudden, it was like everybody in the family was just making sure that I knew I was not accepted, I was not wanted, I was not welcomed. And I remember being around them always feeling tolerated. There was always those in the back, you know. Uh, they were courteous, but just about. And then on top of that, all the gossip, all the hurtful things that were said about me in the back. And I could tell, and I could hear some things. And it hurt me so deeply. You know, I fell way from my high tower, you know, from my high mountain of expectation. And I felt so wounded. Long story short, you know, is that I was so hurt. I was so wounded on the inside that I would, but I knew, I knew that I needed to forgive. So I would forgive and I forgive and I forgive. But every day I could feel that in my heart. Every day I would hear her name. I would feel the squeeze in my heart. Every time she called on the phone, I'd feel like, I don't want to talk to her. And you know what God told me to do? He said, you need to overcome evil with good. You know, listen to that verse. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Overcome evil with good. And so, you know what he told me to do? He said, go. And I remember that. And that happened not just once, but on multiple times. And every time he told me, Go and do something special for her. One time, you know what I did? I had a Mother's Day banquet. I cooked a French meal. I had balloons, gifts, jewelry. I mean, I went all the way out. It was a surprise Mother's Day celebration. And when I, for a week, as I was pre preparing that, I was in the flesh. My heart was like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do it. But the day she walked in the room and saw everything I did, you know what happened? Something happened in my heart. I was free from the offense because I chose to forgive about myself and how I felt, and I chose to overcome it with good. And all of a sudden, I went to her, I took her in my arms, I loved, and I was totally free, you know. So I want to encourage you, overcome evil with good. Don't fall into the devil's trap, amen, and don't allow the devil to get you in that place of offense. Be greater than that. God bless you.